So I just got done reading the latest report from Vitalik Buterin, you know, the mastermind behind Ethereum on the end game of blockchains and blockchain scalability. And man, were there some massive knowledge bombs in there. And so if you're thinking like, hey, what do you mean? What's the end game of blockchain scalability? Then that's what this video is about. Because in order for blockchains to actually achieve you know, mass adoption and accomplish, you know, the use cases that we want, they have to graduate beyond, you know, the form that they exist in today. They need to be able to scale to, you know, 100,000 transactions per second. And there's a bright future ahead of us for blockchain technology, particularly around the Ethereum ecosystem. And Ethereum is well positioned to accomplish this goal. And there's actually lots of path forward, which Vitalik lays out in this paper. And that's exactly what I'm talking about in this video today as a blockchain developer who works with technology on a daily basis. So before we get into that, you know, if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory. And and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step by step from start to finish, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's talk about the future of blockchain technology and what has to happen in order for it to achieve mass adoption and how can we get there? Because like I was saying, that's exactly what Vitalik talks about this paper. I'm going to go through it. So basically, the blockchain needs to be really fast and needs to support, you know, 100,000 transactions per second and it needs to be cheap. And despite what you might think, Ethereum is really well positioned to accomplish this task in the future. Because a lot of people are thinking like, hey, I've used Ethereum before, like it's super expensive, it's really slow, like how is how are we ever going to make this better? And there's a common misconception that we have to wait for Ethereum 2.0 to get here before this problem gets better. So basically, we can get a lot of that benefit now and a lot sooner than that by scaling Ethereum in different ways, which we'll talk about in this video, primarily with uh, rollups based layer two scaling technology. And we can see the various ways that that can happen. So let's go ahead and dig into this. So Vitalik lays out the main problem from the beginning. So he says, consider the average big blockchain, all right, very high block frequency, very high block size, many thousands of transactions per second, but also highly centralized because the blocks are so big, only a few dozen or a hundred nodes can afford to run a fully participating node that can create blocks or verify the existing chain. So what would it take to make such a chain acceptably trustless and censorship resistant, at least by my standards? So basically right there, he's talking about the main problem with, you know, blockchains in the first place, which is you need this high throughput. You need to accommodate many, many, many transactions per second, and they need to be cost effective. And there's multiple strategies to doing this. You know, you could basically you know, take a blockchain and essentially increase the throughput manually. You could just say, instead of taking, you know, 15 transactions per second, we're going to take 150 transactions per second. And now it's 10x the scalability. But the problem is now you have 10x the state size and multiples of the computational resources required to maintain a blockchain with that amount of throughput. And so what happens is you typically end up with fewer people participating in actually running the chain and higher centralization. And he's saying this is a problem. But what's a plausible roadmap to making this better? So basically, you could do second tier staking with lower resource requirements. That uh, leads to distributed block validation. You can have fraud proofs, data ability sam data availability sampling, or add secondary transaction channels to prevent censorship. So this is actually a path forward to making the blockchain that we're talking about more decentralized. And he shows like an implementation of what this would look like. And I'm not going to belabor exactly how it's all going to work. I'll put a link down in the comment section below so you can you know dig into this more. I just kind of want to hit the high level points here so that you can quickly see the big picture. So that's one possible path forward is where you have a high throughput blockchain like this that you make a little more. Or decentralized okay so now let's look at another one so basically consider a long-term possible future for roll-ups so imagine that one particular roll-up whether arbitrum optimism or zk sync start net or something completely new does a really good job of engineering their node implementation where they can do like 10,000 transactions per second and then you have sharding where we have 64 shards and as a result everyone migrates to this roll-up so this is another possible outcome where basically block production is highly centralized, that's in the sort of roll-up environment, but block validation is trustless and highly decentralized and censorship resistant. That's basically that base layer for the blockchain itself. And so in this scenario, like I was saying, this is a scenario where basically one of these roll-ups or maybe one or two captures a majority of the activity, all right, where it's very centralized in this way, all right, but you still have this benefit of, um, you know, the main chain itself provides some decentralization. That's one concern is if you have a roll-up based technology in a layer two that that could introduce a point of centralization. So that is one possible outcome, but it still has benefits. Okay. So now another potential outcome, which this is the third kind of point that he's making is consider the scenario where basically no roll-up succeeds at holding anywhere close to the majority of the Ethereum activity. So let's say, you know, you have all these different uh, uh, layer two scaling solutions and they're all used 
you know, in a very decentralized way, okay? And so they all top out at a few hundred transactions per second. So we get a multi-rollup future for Ethereum, kind of like the Cosmos multi-chain vision, but on top of a base layer that's providing uh, data availability and shared security. That's basically what Ethereum would be functioning in this case. So in this case, he's saying it seems like we could have it all decentralized, validation, robust censorship resistance, and even distributed block production because the rollups are all individually small, so easy to start producing blocks in. And he goes on talking about some more benefits of this and some other trade-offs, all right? So these are all some possible scenarios of what this future could look like. So I know there's a lot of technical details in there, but let me just kind of pick out some of the high points so that you can see like what's important here. So he summarizes some of that here saying, you know, what does it mean for a Ethereum. Well, first of all, Ethereum is well positioned to adjust to this future despite its inherent uncertainty. So they have multiple paths about how we can get to where we want to go. He says the profound benefit of the Ethereum roll-up centric roadmap is that Ethereum is open to all futures and does not have to commit to a certain opinion about which one will necessarily win. And that's the beauty of this base Ethereum layer is a lot of different things can happen on this second layer without compromising, you know, what's going on underneath. So will users very strongly want to be in a single roll-up? You know, we don't know. Or will they, you know, use a variety of rollups? We don't know. And the next question is, you know, what does this mean for big blockchains? Well, there's a path for them turning into something trustless and censorship resistant. And we'll soon find out if their core developers and communities actually value censorship resistance and decentralization enough for them to do it. So it'll likely take years for all this to play out. You know, sharding and data availability technologies are complex to admit. So sharding and data availability sampling are complex technologies to implement. And all this is going to take, you know, quite a bit of time to come to fruition. And so the other big thing to really take note here is that, you know, what got saying at the beginning of this video is Ethereum is really betting on the future of layer two's long term to solve blockchain scalability and how, you know, you can see some of these trade offs here. Uh, or some of these potential outcomes here that many of them have a very good long-term trade-off. Because at the end of the day, you know, you have this scalability trilemma or with blockchains. Basically, you have decentralization, security, and scalability. And you really can't solve this problem. You're always trying to make compromises to get the best trade-off that you can. And Ethereum's, you know, bet on layer twos tries to get the best trade-off of all these worlds. Whereas you have bigger blockchains, which he's talking about here at the end, who want to basically try to make layer ones themselves much faster by increasing the scalability. But, you know, a lot of times that comes either at the expense of one of these three things. And in many cases, it's decentralization. Because like you were saying before, basically, you know, you could create a blockchain that, you know, just decides that instead of going from a, you know, 15 transactions per second, we're just going to up the limit to now do 150 transactions per second. But that gives you 10x scalability. But then you're also going to be increasing the state size at 10x the current rate. <laughs> okay. And so eventually what you're going to run into is the problem where, you know, uh, it takes such a high, it, it, the, it, the computation resources are so great to run a node in order to actually use the state of the blockchain that so many people can be priced out of actually doing it. All right. And so what does that do? Well, it leaves the incentives of people who want the blockchain to succeed to step in and run a nodes. And so in many cases, this is just like, you know, VCs who <laughs> have tried to launch a blockchain really quickly and capitalize off the trend and actually, you know, have centralized control over it. And you can see even in this link and the report about the talks talking about what is, uh, you know, what talking about what, what is minimally decentralized for his standards. And one of the key factors here is it's crucial for blockchain decentralization for regular users to be able to run a node. Now, I know a lot of people will instantly turn around and say like, hey, but you have to have 32 ETH to stake, okay? And like, that's going to price out a lot of people for running blockchain nodes in the first place. Totally get that. But uh, when you're talking about actual decentralization, um, consider this, okay? So Ethereum's been around for a very long time now uh, in, in terms of blockchain world. So the problems I met earlier were basically, there's there's these incentives for basically a VCs to like launch a chain and they don't care if the nodes get centralized because they can just you know, essentially, uh, you know, create this, you know, manufacture the demand, and then it's okay if they step in and run the nodes because then that keeps the project alive. So with Ethereum, though, I mean, you could still have this problem with VCs who got in early, but with proof of work mining, like you had lots of time and, and the bear market that we saw in 2018, 2019, you had lots of time for people to, you know, get 32 ETH enough to run a node for a few thousand dollars. Okay, so we're taking a very long time for the Ethereum supply to decentralize and enough people to accumulate the ability. And so now what you have is the incentive for early adopters and people with skin in the game to actually uh, help you know, the long-term vision of Ethereum. And that is a decentralized user base. It's not just like a centralized, you know, group of 
uh, people who are just insanely rich and have a vested interest. Of course, it's still a community that has a vested interest, but it's more decentralized. That's the whole point. Now, it does prevent new users in many cases from joining that club, but it's still better than the alternative. And the other final thing I want to say about this, um, you know, with Vitalik's you know, vision here, um, he's, he's saying you know, multiple possibilities of how this could play out in the future is what's going to happen, you know, with the rollups. Are we basically going to see, you know, one or two uh, scaling solutions take off? Or are we going to see, you know, things evenly distributed across multiple where you have some sort of, you know, cosmos like future or do we see concentration around a handful? So I'll just kind of offer my opinion on this. I think the more likely outcome of the two is that we see concentration about around a handful of solutions, like one or two. That's assuming that the end user is actually interfacing with these things and is interact with them directly to where they have to make a choice about which one they're using. Okay, so that's the most likely thing is that you'll see a concentration of activity around those things simply because people don't like changing between multiple things. Okay, so the, the caveat is if we have a future where activity exists across multiple, ch- you know, roll-ups, where you don't necessarily, the end user's not interacting with each one individually, doesn't have to switch, then that's a more likely scenario where you could see a much wider decentralized, you know, usage of all those things. This is the area where I think there's, you know, we just don't know enough yet to know for sure. And I think that's expressed pretty well in Vitalik's paper here. So if you have a prediction, leave it down in the comment section below. So that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so that more people can learn about blockchain. And if you're as fascinated with the technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? Well, you go to my YouTube homepage. You can find my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can show you become a blockchain master step-by-step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I thought people with zero coding experience become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.